I'll just continue what Harshad was trying to say that in terms of a services, AWS has around 165 plus services. And within the services, there are hundreds of products are been there. So you can say a couple of thousand products are been available from AWS, irrespective of portfolio or environment which we talk about. So we this this we can talk one on one basis wherever if any somebody wants to talk about an AI or ML, we are happy to take. We have a pre sales guy from our team who should be able to take a separate conversation on that. So just now we're just trying to cover about more about on compute piece. So today also we have seen that 80 to 85 percent business is coming from compute and storage, and these are two very important. Uh, piece of uh, business when we are trying to create and services for the customers. So I just trying to create a uh, taken conversation about on compute storage will be covered by Niraj. So in compute, I'm just to talk about light sale, which is a ready made offering from AWS, which you can start in a minute and put up your application, your services are on, which is inclusive of the comp, uh, core, which we talk about in uh, CPU, it has in storage, it has a networking, DNS management, IP, and you will be able to access other services which can be attached with LightSail when you're trying to configure. I'll try to take some examples. Uh, LightSail can be utilized in when you have to create a website. So we have seen one uh, scenario in the hosting world whenever we have spoken where that there's a one limitation come in a bandwidth. When you are trying to create a uh, website for any customer you think how much bandwidth can be utilized so in this case bandwidth is something which has been capped there are 1 TB bandwidth there is a 7 TB bandwidth both the options are available, multiple options are available which we'll be able to talk about it can be utilized for website e-commerce platform can be utilized for it if you have WordPress business application it is not something can be utilized only for bandwidth perspective sorry uh, website perspective if you have a small application maybe Small CRM is there. This platform or this light sale as a product is good to run any application which you wanted to get into that. If you take an example, you wanted to run a tally which has been running on a Windows platform, it will run very well and customers are using it. So what does it come with? This is bundled compute storage and networking. It has a fully configured server as I told that it can be uh, spin up in a minute's time once you start and put up your application, configure it and your services are up and running into this. Low predictable price, I'll be able to come to the price next slide, how it is getting into the global light sale. The good advantage like AWS has 20 different data centers. A light sale is available in 14 plus data center which can be configured. If you have a customer who is based out of, let's say in London, you want to make use of that data center, you're happy to take it at. If uh, it can be utilized from this respective data center itself. Easy to growth path, access all AWS services can be utilized. And if you wanted to make change of an API and CLI, it, it can be configured it off. Again, this is a combination of all six parameters. So these are the plans which you will be able to see on uh, uh, AWS website also. So first is a Linux plans and second is more about in Windows. So it starts from $3.5 and if you see the configuration which has 512 MB memory and 1 TB data transfer. 1 TB data transfer in $3.5 uh, which is approximate if you talk about 250 rupees. In India if you talk about it would be 50%, 500 GB bandwidth can be utilized in one instance which is costing only $3.5. If you try to increase uh, configuration, it is available in uh, 1 GB memory, then 2 GB, 4 GB, 8 GB, 16 GB, 32 GB. If you see the highest configuration, which is 32 GB memory, 8 core processor, 640 GB uh, uh, storage, SSD or build, and 7 TB data transfer. If this has been hosted in India and Australia, it would be 50%, that would be 3.5 dB. If you see the configuration, it is very good to make use of a bandwidth perspective wherever the customer is making use of a high bandwidth. This fit, give a good fit to the customer and you can make use of it. And we have seen the examples, uh, the uh, 
whenever somebody is making use of a shared hosting they are making use of a highest version which is for 160 dollar or 240 dollar putting up maybe hundred hundreds of their website and making use of it still their bandwidth is not crossing beyond 7 TB or 3.5 TB that is a one of one concern which we noticed it when we see in terms of workload like I told took an example of tele we have uh, seen and we are talking to a couple of more customers they can they are trying to bundle tele along with light sale which is a good fit in eight dollar you are able to get which is approximate 500 rupees uh, per month the customer will be able to pay and you can host your tally instead of taking in uh, physical desktop or a server which you are trying to create it off. Configuration is fixed. Uh, if somebody asks, can we change a configuration? No, this is a fixed configuration, non-changeable. But there is an update. Updates are been coming. Let's if we see a six month back, uh, this uh, 16 GB and 32 GB uh, instances are been rolled out and customers are using today also the prices were been dropped by 50 percent around eight to uh, six to nine months back as as Sarja took an example 70 times prices are been dropped when we see in aws services in first time when this product were been launched about an uh, a five dollar skew which was ten dollar skew was that within a uh, you can say one and a half or one year itself they have reduced by 50 percent because seeing in consumption and the economy of scale has been created off. So we just try to create uh, or we try to compare because at the end of the day we see a light sale is just to uh, taste the water you will be able to take some services of this. Otherwise 80 to 85 percent business is still being covered from EC2 which is in services from AWS and there are multiple options are being configured off. It has all type of environment has been created uh, it is uh, memory optimized or I optimized. You have all options are been available. There will be 100 plus configurations are available. You may use on a pay as you go model. You may use on a reserve instance basis. In reserve instance also there are multiple options are there. You can take in one year, one year commitment but no upfront money which is not available in, in if you talk about other cloud service provider. Or if you wanted to commit for three years, wanted to pay for monthly, that's also been available. If you wanted to pay quarterly, comment for a three years, that's also been available. So a lot of uh, permutation combinations are been created off when you're trying to create a light sale uh, EC2 combination there. Let me just give an example because at the end of the day, EC2 gives an highest revenue in terms of an uh, consumption perspective. So where, to, where do we use light sale and where do we use EC2? The small differentiations have been created, it's been covered in earlier slides also. Like small scale multi-tier app, which you can make use of it if you have few uh, users or a few application wanted to use small configuration can be utilized into this environment website web apps testing environment line of business when we say ec2 is more about a larger and multi-tier application like you have an sap you have an erp your large application which is ios are very high you will be able to make use of ec2 environment and ec2 also there are multiple options are been created off if we see in operating system perspective and application stack, everything is available in EC2. When we say operating system, it is an Ubuntu, it is a Linux, it is Windows is available there. When we say application, you have WordPress, you have a Zoomla. If you say stack, LAMP stack, all the uh, possibilities are being provided in LightSail. So LightSail is more about when you start or it tastes the water. Once you grow yourself, you should be able to take another services or if it is getting fulfilled off, for, from an environment you can always try to upgrade so it has been a pre-configured instance as I took an example it is start from uh, 512 MB to 8 uh, GB memory RAM can be created off and also in case any additional things has been required let's say storage is less you can take an additional storage as an SSD drive if you wanted to take an additional IP which has also been available there so it has been created uh, in an environment if you wanted to upgrade you can have an additional services which has been there so this was more about a light sale how we can make use of it any specific uh, query we are happy to take or we can take it uh, later whatever whenever you are comfortable with thank you yeah One sixty-five. One sixty-five. Yeah. Can you walk us through a few of the major 
products. So when you say uh, the compute is one, storage, then uh, uh, network, then CDN. So these are the products when beyond this, if you go in application perspective, analytics, machine learning, IoT. So these kind of platforms have been created, these kind of services have been created, which is plug and play if you wanted to start services tomorrow. Just take a platform from AWS, put up your application and start using it. Yeah, we can, we have, a, we should be able to take it up. That is been required for. But number of services are there if you talk about, think about a service which is available here as a platform perspective. But that's very interesting, 165. 165. Now it's increasing year on year basis. So every quarter services are getting introduced by AWS. Sure. We'll we'll take it up, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Satish. Next, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call upon Neeraj Matiani from AWS to come on stage and talk on storage and mobility solutions from AWS services perspective. Neeraj is a part of platform business development team at Amazon Web Services. He is the head storage and mobility services at Amazon Internet Services Private Limited. I request everyone to please welcome him with a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you still upset with the match? I'm sure you are. I'm very upset. So I was thinking of going back and not actually presenting. But that, that was not an option. So just, uh, just to uh, tell you what I'm going to cover in the next 15 odd minutes, it's uh, AWS storage, right? And how we, what we do in storage. And uh, hopefully by the end of it, you'll be pretty impressed and start selling a lot of storage from AWS. So storage is a foundation service in the sense that when AWS was launched, one of the initial services was storage. Is the mic working okay? Yeah, good. One of the foundation storage services was storage uh, because if you want to compute, if you want IT, right, there is information and for information you need storage, right? So like uh, our prime minister says, ease of living, I don't know if you, uh, whatever you agree or disagree with him, the the statements which he makes are pretty attractive from a uh, per, from the consum consumption perspective of the audience, right? So similarly with storage, we make ease of, of use very easy for our customers, correct? So like earlier when I was doing business on premises, uh, we used to tell our customers uh, which storage, what do you want, what what does the storage do? in terms of what is it made of, what are the disks, and spend a lot of time in explaining what is inside the product, correct? And when the customer is to ask, is it okay, but what kind of performance you'll get and what is the reliability, those were tougher questions, right? Today, with AWS, the question of what is inside is never discussed. That's our problem. But what customers get in terms of performance, in terms of price, in terms of they pay exactly for the use for is really what we tell our customers. So, unko taklif hoti hai ki what happened now in, in two, two lines you have finished the whole discussion ki you can add data as much as you want, whenever you want, you can delete data and you pay only for what you are doing and this is the kind of performance that you will get. Simple. Correct? So, the first slide is the Gartner Magic Quadrant. Uh, so, there is a Magic Quadrant for cloud storage and as you can see, there is a big difference between AWS and rest of the players in the market. There's a huge difference. And we have been leading this quadrant for the last four years it's been in existence. And the gap between us and the others is actually getting wider. And why is that so? The first reason is the extensive products, the extensive services that we have on storage. 
It's a little busy slide, complex slide. Uh, you don't have to read all of it, but essentially the boxes are the products that we have. So SAN or block storage, and in that you can see there are some five or six kinds of storage, right? These are priced based on how much data you provision. So if you want one terabyte, you pay for one terabyte. If you want to increase it on the fly, you can increase it. If you want to reduce it, you reduce it and you pay less for it, right? The other box is file services, so NAS. So you have a Windows NAS or Windows file services, you have NFS file services. These again are charged on how much you have stored. So you don't have to tell us what kind of capacity you want. You can add data and you start paying more for it. And if you reduce data, your bill reduces on its own, right? At the same time, you get fantastic performance. The bigger box is actually object storage, which essentially is the fundamental base of the cloud. So today the cloud industry runs mostly from a data perspective on object storage. So this is unique. And if you can see, we have now almost six or seven different kinds of object storage, starting from approximately $25 per month per terabyte to all the way to almost $2 per month per terabyte for archival purpose, purposes, right? So this is the extensive range of products that we have. Now, when we talk of reliability, Harshad covered that we have a uh, architecture where we have multiple data centers, right? The storage service runs in such a way that data is copied across at least three different places, which are kilometers apart. And you don't pay for the multiple copies we make. Customer pays only for the actual data he is stored. So if he stored one terabyte, he pays for one terabyte. If he stores one GB, he pays for one GB. That's why our price is per GB because that's the minimum uh, price we charge for, right? And it's our job to make sure that the service is, re is resilient. For example, S3 gives 11 nines durability, which means that the chances of losing your data is next to none. Like we have never lost anybody's data in the last so many years of operation. So highly reliable. You don't have to worry about DR. You don't have to worry about how to copy data. That's essentially the backbone of our service. Now, if you look at the circles, so this is actually the journey of what the customer does when he uses uh, storage from AWS. So the first circle is rehost. So you're a new customer to the cloud. So you want to quickly move your applications onto uh, AWS. So you don't want to recode, you don't want to redevelop, make it cloud friendly. So you just start using our block services, you start using our uh, inherent storage inside EC2, and you launch your same application which you are running on premises on uh, AWS. The second comes when you want to re-platform. For example, you're running database on a SAN on, uh, on your data center. Now you want to run the same database, you will you will use a file service called uh, EFS, which is a managed file service, where you just store your database and you start using it. And you pay as and when you keep on increasing your data. So you've re-platformed it, but you have not changed your basic code. And the third comes is when you re-architect your solution, correct? Which means that you use cloud tools, you use cloud technology and build a new application or adopt a new application. That's when you will end up using uh, uh, an object store kind of a uh, storage from AWS and take the real benefit of cloud, both in terms of performance, in terms of reliability, and of course, uh, the durability that the platform provides. Quickly, what do our customers building or what do they use storage for? The first thing is backup and restore archival home directories instead of a home, a NAS on premises, data lakes, and of course, business critical applications. Quickly, uh, one of the first use cases is to back up the data that you have on premises. It's a pain for customers to back data, keep the tapes, keep the disks, and you know preserve them. What we tell customers is move the data to AWS, use one of our cheap storage tiers like uh, Glacier or like uh, Deep Archive, and you know take the advantage of our multiple copies, which gives you resiliency, and at the same time reduce your cost of backing up. So that's the first uh, use case people have. The second is home directories. Why have your own NAS when all you can do is use AWS's Windows file services or Linux file services or NFS and create your home directories and give access to your employees uh, on the cloud. That's a great use case. The third is business critical applications. So if you're running ERP, if you're running you know, a Salesforce application, whatever application which is business critical, run it on AWS storage. 
because you get again great performance and you know guarantee of a growth in performance for example if you are using storage on premises and you after one year two years you realize that you don't have enough performance what can you do then you have to buy new storage and you have to migrate data and most likely you will do nothing but live for it for the next couple of years till you reach your upgrade cycle but on aws the performance is on the tap so you keep on increasing your performance as and when you need more hybrid cloud so we also do uh, a, a hybrid cloud which means that we have a service called aws storage gateway which actually sits in the customer's data center and it helps you move data to aws public cloud so you store data on the storage gateway aws moves the data for you in the public cloud similarly you can move data back onto your premises using the storage gateway so you can have a hybrid environment where you say 20% of data which i need to access frequently i'll store it in the storage gateway on premises the balance 80% which is cold data i'll use aws's cloud storage to save it there reducing my on premises cost and at the same time uh, you know enjoying the resiliency that aws provides data lakes uh, aws s3 which is essentially the largest storage service in the world today is actually also the largest uh, what you call data lake service so the storage inherently is built for a data lakes right and the reason it is because it has unmatched durability performance and very high security and compliance and so that you can spend your time in analyzing data build your uh, data lakes very quickly using our tools and the best part is that you don't do data lake analytics all the time you probably do it 10 15% of the time the rest of the time the computer is just running correct so on aws your storage is s3 your data lake data is on s3 our storage service whereas you use your ec2 compute servers you run it only when you want it from an analytics perspective shut it down and save money right the same thing if you do it on premises you have to buy those servers and you have to buy that storage and you have to keep the whole setup running and paying for it all the time quickly i think about it if you have a customer who wants to move say 50 gb of data onto aws so how does he move so we have a lot of options 50 gb he can probably just move it on uh, internet straight away right but if he wants to move 50 gb every day and also download 50 gb every day so maybe he should take a direct connection which is a network service from aws to ensure that he has you know a short bandwidth available to move data right but suppose a customer says i want to move 200 terabytes from my on premises data center to aws one time only how does it do that just just if you could help me uh, guess how do you move to 200 terabytes one time onto aws so what who said who said uh, great so we actually have a physical device called snowball which is around 80 to 100 terabytes you order it from us we deliver the uh, device to you you load the data on it we carry it back and give the data to you on our storage so we use physical means to move data similarly most people don't realize that snowball is also data or device so if you for whatever reason you want to pull 100 tb data out of aws again you say i want this data on a snowball and we'll ship it back to you and you can then take it on to your on premises data center so we have that problem of one time upload one time download continuous upload or you know other ways to actually move data so if you can see there are so many ways you can move data whether it's migration or for regular purpose lastly we are not alone there are tons of people out there tons of partners out there who provide aws as a storage device as a storage service for their applications now they could be primary applications they could be backup archival uh, dr applications or even uh, you know services from a consulting perspective so if you see the logos out there all the big names in storage which have been on premises whether it is netapp or dell emc or uh, you know uh, veritas they're all there comvault they're all there they all use aws storage so you can take a you can use veritas you can use uh, uh, what you call netapp you can use uh, dell emc software and use aws storage as the backup device or as the primary storage device so when you come across customers who say i have you know uh, networker or i have veritas as my software to backup or i use uh, this particular software what do i do 
So most likely, they will be natively supporting AWS storage. And instead of having their own equipment on premises, they can actually go and use AWS storage straight away without having to implement anything new. So we have a pretty wide partner network to help customers use AWS storage. So in summary, like I said, ease of use, ease of living, you just straight away start uh, you know, using uh, AWS storage. You want to you want to use one petabyte today? You can start doing it. The data, the capacity is available for you, right? And we have a very long list of services, and that's the reason why Gartner rates us so high. That we have a very large list of storage services available for customers today. Feature set is unmatched in the industry, and we are actually gaining over the other players. Highly secure, highly secure environment. The kind of locks that we put, the kind of you know uh, compliances that we adhere to, and the kind of processes that we go to, it makes it actually easy for customers when they go to audits. Because whatever audits we go through, the customer uses the same reports to convince their auditors that yes, their environment is secure, which is very difficult on an on-premises environment. And finally, we make it easy for customers to migrate their data onto AWS or or bringing it back. That's the end of my presentation. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, you want to migrate from where to where? I want to migrate my data from somewhere where you start it now. Hmm. And this data is around 7 terabytes. Hmm. I take that server service from you and then after migration I can... Uh, so you want to migrate data from on-premises in Delhi to on-premises in Calcutta? Yes. Right. So Snowball is designed in such a way that it is highly encrypted, correct? So, to it, and the reason we do that is because customers' data is traveling through a normal courier blue dot, correct? So, only we can open it, which means that the, the snowball has to, we can, we extract the data onto AWS and we load, load the data from AWS. So, for if you want to use it to migrate, uh, that's not possible within your own premises because you will not be able to extract the data out. But you can migrate data onto AWS and then download it from there. You can do that if you want to. You can do that, but you have to look at the commercial aspect of it, whether it works out or not. Right? But yes, it's a little bit of a holding your nose this way, but it can be done. But why not just migrate to AWS and you know enjoy the advantages that the storage provides? Exactly, that's a good question. How does it matter to you whether we are doing thin or thick? The way we charge is, suppose you want 500 TB of what kind of storage? Uh, suppose SLD or... uh, for what, block storage, for you know file, for what kind of... For file. For file? So for file, if you use our object. Uh, object storage or if you use our file services, we charge you per GB of what you have stored on an average of a month. So if you store for one day and then you delete your data, we'll charge you only for that day and what you have stored. Yeah, the item, because I need to buy the budget only for one first time. Because I go for my management that we have to purchase configuration till a uh, one terabyte or two terabyte is supposed to be ten terabyte. And I'm using only uh, fifty percent of that. And then fifty percent is still left. You will charge me for that fifty percent or for the whole one. We will charge you for what you have stored. Yes, so if you stored 50%, you will get charged for that amount, not for more than that. So it's like a electricity bill, right? How much you use, uh, you pay for that. Any further questions? They also charge up a load. Pardon me? They also charge up a load. We don't, we don't, but that's where the, that's where the commodity is not there anymore. You have to tell us, you don't have to tell us. You don't have to, unless you're saying you're going to come with 20 petabytes, so it's a good idea to tell us in advance, right? But otherwise, for most customers, uh, they don't tell us. Whatever they load, they get charged, that's all. Because customers themselves don't know what they want. They just guess, right? In the storage industry, you plan for five years, and you most likely either you exhausted in two years or you don't exhausted in ten years, correct? We are saying, don't plan. We are there for you. You just use. And if you don't use, you don't pay for it. If you use more, you pay more. How does it's good for? You. Where do you get the 
different perspective. Okay. Any further questions? Good. Thanks a lot. Good evening. Are you still upset with the match? I'm sure you are. I'm very upset. So I was thinking of going back and not actually presenting. But that, that was not an option. <clears throat> so just, uh, just to uh, tell you what I'm going to cover in the next uh, 15 odd minutes, it's on uh, AWS storage, right? And uh, how we, what we do in storage. And uh, hopefully by the end of it, you'll be pretty impressed and start selling a lot of storage from AWS. So storage is a foundation service in the sense that when AWS was launched, one of the initial services was storage. Is the mic working okay? Yeah, yeah good. One of the foundation storage services was storage uh, because if you want to compute, if you want IT, right, there is information and for information you need storage, right? So like uh, our prime minister says, ease of living, I don't know if you... Uh, whatever you agree or disagree with him, the the statements which he makes are pretty attractive from a uh, per, from the consum consumption perspective of the audience, right? So similarly with storage, we make ease of, of use very easy for our customers, correct? So like earlier when I was doing business on premises, uh, we used to tell our customers uh, which storage, what do you want, what what does the storage do in terms of what is it made of? What are the disks? And spend a lot of time in explaining what is inside the product, correct? And when the customer is to ask, is theek hai, par milega kya? what kind of performance you'll get and what is the reliability? Those were tougher questions, right? Today, with AWS, the question of what is inside is never discussed. That's our problem. But what customers get in terms of performance, in terms of price, in terms of they pay exactly for the use for is really what we tell our customers. So, unko taklif hoti hai ki what happened now in, in two, two lines you have finished the whole discussion ki you can add data as much as you want, whenever you want, you can delete data and you pay only for what you are doing and this is the kind of performance that you will get. Simple. Correct? So, the first slide is the gut magic quadrant. Uh, so, there is a magic quadrant for cloud storage and as you can see, there is a big difference between AWS and rest of the players in the market. There's a huge difference. And we have been leading this quadrant for the last four years it's been in existence. And the gap between us and the others is actually getting wider. And why is that so? The first reason is the extensive products, the extensive services that we have on storage. It's a little busy slide, complex slide. Uh, you don't have to read all of it, but essentially the boxes are the products that we have. So SAN or block storage, and in that you can see there are some five or six kinds of storage, right? These are priced based on how much data you provision. So if you want one terabyte, you pay for one terabyte. If you want to increase it on the fly, you can increase it. If you want to reduce it, you reduce it and you pay less for it, right? The other box is file services, so NAS. So you have a Windows NAS or Windows file services, you have NFS file services. These again, are charged on how much you have stored. So you don't have to tell us what kind of capacity you want. You can add data and you start paying more for it. And if you reduce data, your bill reduces on its own, right? At the same time, you get fantastic performance. The bigger box is actually object storage, which essentially is the fundamental base of the cloud. So today the cloud industry runs mostly from a data perspective on object storage. So this is unique. And if you can see, we have now almost six or seven different kinds of object storage, starting from approximately $25 per month per terabyte to all the way to almost $2 per month per terabyte for archival purpose, purposes, right? So this is the extensive range of products that we have. Now, when we talk of reliability, Harshad covered that we have a uh, architecture where we have multiple data centers, right? The storage service runs in such a way that data is copied across at least three different places, which are kilometers apart. And you don't pay for the multiple copies we make. Customer pays only for the actual data he is stored. So if he stored one terabyte, he pays for one terabyte. If he stores one GB, he pays for one GB. That's why our price is per GB because that's the minimum uh, price we charge for, right? And it's our job to make sure that the service is, re is resilient. For example, 
S3 gives 11 nines durability, which means that the chances of losing your data is next to none, like we have never lost anybody's data in the last so many years of operation. So highly reliable, you don't have to worry about DR, you don't have to worry about how to copy data. That's essentially the backbone of our service. Now if you look at the circles, so this is actually the journey of what the customer does when he uses uh, storage from AWS. So the first circle is rehost. So you're a new customer to the cloud. So you want to quickly move your applications onto uh, AWS. So you don't want to recode, you don't want to redevelop, make it cloud friendly. So you just start using our block services, you start using our uh, inherent storage inside EC2 and you launch your same application which you are running on premises on uh, AWS. The second comes when you want to re-platform. For example, you're running database on a SAN on, uh, on your data center. Now you want to run the same database, you will you will use a file service called uh, EFS, which is a managed file service, where you just store your database and you start using it. And you pay as and when you keep on increasing your data. So you've re-platformed it, but you have not changed your basic code. And the third comes is when you re-architect your solution, correct? Which means that you use cloud tools, you use cloud technology and build a new application or adopt a new application. That's when you will end up using uh, uh, an object store kind of a uh, storage from AWS and take the real benefit of cloud, both in terms of performance, in terms of reliability, and of course, uh, the durability that the platform provides. Quickly, what do our customers building or what do they use storage for? The first thing is backup and restore, archival, home directories, instead of a home, a NAS on premises, data lakes, and of course, business critical applications. Quickly, uh, one of the first use cases is to back up the data that you have on premises. It's a pain for customers to back data, keep the tapes, keep the disks, and you know, preserve them. What we tell customers is move the data to AWS, use one of our cheap storage tiers like uh, Glacier or like uh, Deep Archive, and you know, take the advantage of our multiple copies, which gives you resiliency, and at the same time, reduce your cost of backing up. So this is the first uh, use case people have. The second is home directories. Why have your own NAS when all you can do is use AWS's Windows file services or Linux file services or NFS and create your home directories and give access to your employees uh, on the cloud. It's a great use case. The third is business critical applications. So if you're running ERP, if you're running you know, a Salesforce application, whatever application which is business critical, run it on AWS storage because you get, again, great performance and you know, guarantee of a growth in performance. For example, if you're using storage on-premises and you, after one year, two years, you realize that you don't have enough performance, what can you do? Then you have to buy new storage and you have to migrate data and most likely you will do nothing but live for it for the next couple of years till you reach your upgrade cycle. But on AWS, the performance is on the tab. So you keep on increasing your performance as and when you need more. Hybrid cloud. So we also do uh, a, a hybrid cloud, which means that we have a service called AWS Storage Gateway, which actually sits in the customer's data center. And it helps you move data to AWS public cloud. So you store data on the storage gateway. And AWS moves the data for you in the public cloud. Similarly, you can move data back onto your premises using the storage gateway. So you can have a hybrid environment where you say, 20% of data which I need to access frequently, I'll store it in the storage gateway on premises. The balance 80% which is cold data, I'll use AWS's cloud storage to save it there, reducing my on-premises cost, and at the same time, uh, you know, enjoying the resiliency that AWS provides. Data lakes, uh, AWS S3, which is essentially the largest storage service in the world today, is actually also the largest, uh, what you call data lake service. So the storage inherently is built for uh, data lakes, right? And the reason it is because it has unmatched durability performance and very high security and compliance. And so that you can spend your time in analyzing data, build your uh, data lakes very quickly using our tools. And the best part is that you don't do data lake analytics all the time. You probably do it 10, 15% of the time. The rest of the time, the compute is just running, correct? 
So on AWS, your storage is S3, your data lake data is on S3, our storage service, whereas you use your EC2 compute servers, you run it only when you want it from an analytics perspective, shut it down and save money, right? The same thing if you do it on premises, you have to buy those servers and you have to buy that storage and you have to keep the whole setup running and paying for it all the time. Quickly, uh, think about it. If you have a customer who wants to move, say, 50 GB of data onto AWS. So how does he move? So we have a lot of options. 50 GB, he can probably just move it on uh, internet straight away, right? But if he wants to move 50 GB every day and also download 50 GB every day, so maybe he should take a direct connection, which is a network service from AWS to ensure that he has, you know, a short bandwidth available to move data, right? But suppose a customer says, I want to move 200 terabytes from my on-premises data center to AWS one time only. How does he do that? Just, just if you could help me uh, guess, how do you move to 200 terabytes one time onto AWS? Snowball. Snowball. Who's that? Who said? Uh, great. So we actually have a physical device called Snowball, which is around 80 to 100 terabytes. You order it from us. We deliver the uh, device to you. You load the data on it. We carry it back and give the data to you on our storage. So we use physical means to move data. Similarly, most people don't realize that Snowball is also data or device. So if you, for whatever reason, you want to pull 100 dB data out of AWS, again, you say, I want this data on a Snowball and we'll ship it back to you and you can then take it onto your on-premises data center. So we have the problem of one-time upload, one-time download, continuous upload, or, you know, other ways to actually move data. So if you can see, there are so many ways you can move data, whether it's migration or for regular purpose. Lastly, we are not alone. There are tons of people out there, tons of partners out there who provide AWS as a storage device, as a storage service for their applications. Now, they could be primary applications, they could be backup, archival, uh, DR applications, or even uh, you know, services from a consulting perspective. So if you see the logos out there, all the big names in storage which have been on premises, whether it is NetApp or Dell EMC or, uh, you know, uh, Veritas, they're all there, Comvault, they're all there. They all use AWS storage. So you can take a, you can use Veritas, you can use, uh, uh, what do you call, NetApp, you can use uh, Dell EMC software and use AWS storage as the backup device or as the primary storage device. So when you come across customers who say, I have, you know, uh, networker or I have Veritas as my software to backup or I use uh, this particular software, what do I do? So most likely they will be natively supporting AWS storage and instead of having their own equipment on premises, they can actually go and use AWS storage straight away without having to implement anything new. So we have a pretty wide partner network to help customers use AWS storage. So in summary, like I said, ease of use, ease of living, you just straight away start, uh, you know, using uh, AWS storage. You want to you want to use one petabyte today? You can start doing it. The data, the capacity is available for you, right? And we have a very long list of services, and that's the reason why Gartner rates us so high. That we have a very large list of storage services available for customers today. Feature set is unmatched in the industry, and we are actually gaining over the other players. Highly secure highly secure environment, the kind of locks that we put, the kind of, you know, uh, compliances that we adhere to, and the kind of processes that we go to, it makes it actually easy for customers when they go to audits, because whatever audits we go through, the customer uses the same reports to convince their auditors that yes, their environment is secure, which is very difficult on our on-premises environment. And finally, we make it easy for customers to migrate their data onto AWS or, or bringing it back. That's the end of my presentation. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer. You want to migrate from where to where? I want to migrate my data from somewhere where you start it now. Hmm. This data is around 7 terabytes. Hmm. I take that Snowball service from you and then after migration I can... Uh, so you want to migrate data from on-premises in Delhi to on-premises in Calcutta? Yes. Right. So Snowball is designed in such a way that it is highly encrypted, correct? So 
to it. And the reason we do that is because customer's data is traveling through a normal courier blue dot, correct? So only we can open it, which means that the, the snowball has to, we can, we extract the data onto AWS and we load, load the data from AWS. So for, if you want to use it to migrate, uh, that's not possible within your own premises because you will not be able to extract the data out. But you can migrate data onto AWS and then download it from there. You can do that if you want to. You can do that, but you have to look at the commercial aspect of it, whether it works out or not. Right? But yes, it's a little bit of a holding your nose this way, but it can be done. But why not just migrate to AWS and you know enjoy the advantages that the storage provides? Exactly, that's a good question. How does it matter to you whether we are doing thin or thick? The way we charge is, suppose you want 500 TB of what kind of storage? Uh, suppose SLD or... uh, for what? Block storage? For, you know, file? For what kind of... For file? For file? So for file, if you use our uh, object storage or if you use our file services, we charge you per GB of what you have stored on an average of a month. So if you store for one day and then you delete your data, we'll charge you only for that day and what you have stored. We will charge you for what you have stored. stored. Yes, yeah, so if you have stored 50%, you will get charged for that amount, not for more than that. Just like a electricity bill, right? How much you use, uh, you pay for that. Any further questions? Pardon me? <laughs> we don't, we don't, but that's where the that's where the commodity is not there anymore. You have to tell us. You don't have to tell us. You don't have to. Unless you are saying you are going to commit 20 petabytes, so it's a good idea to tell us in advance, right? But otherwise, for most customers, uh, they don't tell us. Whatever they load, they get charged. That's all. Because customers themselves don't know what they want. They just guess, right? In the storage industry, you plan for five years yeah. and you most likely either you exhaust it in two years or you don't exhaust it in 10 years. Correct? We are saying don't plan. We are there for you. You just use. And if you don't use, you don't pay for it. If you use more, you pay more. How does it's good for you? Very different perspective. Okay? Any further questions? Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Neeraj. Next, ladies and gentlemen, I would request Binu Balan from AWS to please come up on stage and talk on content delivery solutions from AWS services perspectives. Binu is a part of platform business development team at Amazon Web Services. He is the head Edge and Security Services, India and South Asia at Amazon India Services Private Limited. May I please request everyone to welcome him with a huge round of applause. Um, hi everyone. Um, thank you for the previous speakers to uh, you know give us an insight on AWS and on the other services. Um, like um, the slide says it's Edge Services, right? So once you have um, hosted your content um, on storage or on our EC2 ELB um, and so on, how do you ensure that uh, that is available for your end users globally? So that's what Edge Services is all about. Um, there are five components um, in the Edge Services uh, product portfolio. Uh, the major one being CloudFront, which is a CDN. And um, I'm sure most of you are using CDN uh, in your existing setup. Uh, we've got um, Route 53, which is our uh, uh, DNS, uh, WAF, Anti-DDoS, which is part of our security services, and Lambda at the edge. Um, this is a quick graphical representation of how your data is going to travel to your end users. Um, for instance, that is where your content is hosted 
it could be in your on-prem or at AWS. Uh, when your end user is requesting for content, uh, the request all the way goes uh, to the origin, picks up the content and comes back. It travels through multiple networks and ISPs. What we don't understand is that um, no one owns the internet, right? Um, and no one has got control how your data is passed between your origin and your end user. For instance, if your content is hosted in Delhi on-prem or you know at Mumbai AWS and your end user is somewhere um, in Chennai, it is always not necessary that it takes the shortest route, right? Um, it, there's all probability that the content travels probably from if your end user is in Chennai, it goes to Singapore, from Singapore to probably uh, Japan and Japan uh, to the US and comes back for the content. So it goes through multiple networks, um, ISPs and so on. And what happens when, when the data travels in such a manner? You've got a lot of delay, right? Um, your end users are very unhappy because your content uh, is not picked up in the fastest manner and it's not delivered in the fastest manner. And uh, apart from that, when it's traveling through the public internet, there's a lot of uh, chances that your data can be stolen, your site can be hacked, right? Um, and what that relates to is, you know, bad customer experience. So what happens when you have a CDN, uh, and especially if you have, you're hosted in uh, the AWS data center, and if you're using CloudFront as a CDN, it uses, a, it uses the uh, AWS's backbone. So we have a set uh, routes uh, to pick up and deliver content from your origin to your end user. So it, it uses a latency based routing, right? So uh, content travels the fastest way possible, um, you know, using our AWS network and our Route 53, we've got the shield and uh, WAP which protects your site and your, uh, you know, and your end, end user's personal information. Um, and it's super fast. Um, it's not as simple as this is. There's a lot of technology that goes behind this in terms of routing and caching and so on. Um, to to put, put in a very simple word, right? What does a CDN do, right? Very simply, it reduces the load on the origin and it increases the end user satisfaction. So anything, if I could take an example of Facebook, right? Something that we all use. If you see most of Facebook's page is static. The JS, CS, the body, except your image um, and something that is related to your personal information, just everything is static. So CDN would cache all that content as close as possible to the end user so that the request does not have to travel to the origin to pick up and deliver. So what happens? Your origin is safeguarded. You build a very small origin, as small as possible, to take care of minimal requests. The rest load is taken by the CDN servers, right? And when your content is picked up and delivered from a, from the from the closest uh, you know pop, your end users see a better satisfaction there. And this is a key benefit of a CDN. And who can use CDN? Any customer who has a website or an app, if that is revenue generating or if it's phase of the organization, it's very critical to have a CDN. I'm sure you work with a lot of SMBs and they want a beautiful site, right? If you look back, right, about uh, 10 years back, you only had a very small site, a few hundred KBs in size. Now customers want a very interactive site. They want high quality images, very dynamic. Now average site is about what, two and a half to three MB in size. They spend so much, so much of money in building a site and a website, but what if it is not being able to tell, if you're not able to deliver that content in a fashionable manner? There's, there's no point, right, in you building a website. And this technology ensures that it takes care of that. Right? Whatever you know, effort and money you're spending in building the content, it is taken care of by delivering it in an optimal manner. Um, yeah, I'm just running through really quick so that you know I'm not in between your Daru session. Um, so everyone has got a you know people think that hey CDN can only be used for um, delivery of videos or large files and stuff. No, anything anything that's delivered on HTTP HTTPS you, you could use CDN for a website delivery for. A, API acceleration that is dynamic content for um, anything that you have to do with content, uh, customized content uh, delivery with uh, Lambda at the edge, large file downloads like the large customers like Sony and um, Samsung, uh, then the video streaming like you can talk about Hotstar, um, Boot, 
uh, Sony and so on, um, and Static Object Gallery, which is the, the basic website, right? And how do we do it, right? Um, we do it by caching the content as close as possible to the end user, and we, we've built POPs. POPs is nothing but points of presence where we cache content. So we've strategically placed 187 POPs globally, and all these POPs are, e, you know, interconnected using our own fiber or lease fiber. So we are forming a intranet over the internet, right? So the moment your content gets onto, um, you know, the AWS backbone or, or CloudFront, it travels on our on our platform, on, you know, it, it travels on the private backbone. So the delivery of content becomes very seamless. You see, these are, you know, basically uh, the, the, the cities. We've got 16 in India. Um, and we're going to grow more. Um, there are 176 POPs and 11 RECs, right? Um, okay, this is information of how we deliver content, you know, basis, uh, latency-based routing. Okay, this is very important. Um, RECs, you remember when, when, I, when I spoke about the, the importance of CDN, it reduces the load on the origin. So now we have got 187 POPs. Tomorrow or probably in a year, we might have a have a thousand POPs. So your origin would get requests from all those thousand pops. The content is requested by the end user. So we are we are actually defying our the basic of CDN, right? So your origin is going to be loaded again. So to ensure that your origin is not loaded, and to ensure that the caching is done for a longer duration, we built the regional edge cache. Regional edge cache is 10x the size minimum of a normal uh, pop, so it can cache content for the longer duration. And the regional edge cache is the only uh, pop that is designated to talk to your origin infrastructure. So when you have a billion requests coming from multiple POPs, it hits the regional edge cache and one request goes to your origin and that's it. Your origin has to only provide information to that one request and rest is replicated. Until unless your content is highly dynamic, um, probably like a stock ticker or um, um, quick buzz, right, where the scores are changing every second. Otherwise, you can use the origin, the regional edge cache to deliver your content. Um, these are a few examples, right? So we've got Airtel, one of our largest customers in India. Um, so the reason I brought up Airtel, even though we've got larger customers, similar larger customers, is because Airtel already has their own network in India, right? Um, it is very probably easy for them to, you know, build a Syrian and deliver content, but it is not possible, and that's the only reason they they rely on us uh, because we've got the expertise. So they deliver 50 million. Uh, you know, videos and they've got 50 million users. They've, they've delivered a 1.2 million peak during the India South Africa series. Um, Bink is on us, part of Airtel again, where we deliver, uh, you know, close to 2 billion songs in a month. Uh, other customers are ShareChat. I don't know if you've heard of ShareChat. It's similar to TikTok. It's a vernacular um, based um, uh, social media organization. Um, we had a challenge there to deliver content to tier 3 and tier 4 cities. Um, on 2G and 3G mobile. So we optimize the network to do that. Um, GeoSavan delivers a lot of content for us. Uh, all Balaji is all in on us. They um, deliver all kind of OTT content. Um, LRN is an enterprise customer. They, are, uh, um, they do training on ethics, right, and compliances. They, they, uh, they migrated from one of our largest competitors onto us. Um, so this, this is to just let you guys know that, hey, for CloudFront, CloudFront is an independent service of AWS, right? We don't care what your origin is. It could be your, you know, on-prem. It could be a third party. We will perform the way it is optimal. It becomes a little more easier if it is AWS because there is a, a backbone connectivity between CloudFront and the AWS uh, services. But otherwise, you could use any origin, for that matter, to deliver content. Um, a quick representation of, you know, um, what is dynamic, right? This is dynamic content. Uh, rest, everything is static. Your cart is static. Um, these are dynamic content. Otherwise, everything is static on this. So, uh, on a website, typically 80% of the content is static. The rest is dynamic. So, you, you can make out, right? Um, pricing. CloudFront has got a very straightforward pricing. It's got a private pricing. where we only charge you for what has been consumed by an end user. Period. There is no, we, we take care of the request component, HTTPS delivery is taken care of, we don't charge for midgres, 
we don't charge any platform fees and so on. So it's a pretty straightforward pricing. Um, Lambda at the edge, it is sim something similar to LightSail, um, where you move all your, you know, smaller components, um, what, you, what you actually do on your Lambda to the edge. For instance, image re resizing or redirection. So it does not need you to, where you don't need to have an application to be hosted, you can all push that to the edge. So that's that's a service that we offer on CloudFront. Um, WAF and Shield security is prime for you know Amazon and AWS. Am I running out of time? So um, we've got okay. This is quickly the kind of threats that you see um, with AWS uh, WAF and Shield. We are able to take care of. Um, all the security threats to layer, layer 7 protection. These are a few of the, um, you know, the threats that you usually see in the market. Um, bad bots, um, SQL injection. So we take care of the transport, um, application network layer all put together. Um, in DDoS, we have an option to, there's a team that um, ensures that your content, your site, your application is monitored day in and day out. Um, we work as your extended team. Um, to prepare, monitor, and respond to, you know, if there's an attack that happens. Um, so we've got built-in protection and protection tools. We work with a lot of, lot of uh, partners with this. It's very easy to use like any of the other AWS services. You just, you know, pay for as as much as you use, as simple as that. Um, sorry. These are fewer of, of our partners. Um, who help us manage um, the, the security services for us. Um, in in the, okay, VAP benefits, as I said, it's affordable, easy to deploy, and you just pay for what you use. Um, we've got two services under uh, uh, under a VAP, under a security services. One is the Shield, and the Shield Standard, and the Shield Advanced. Shield Standard is, by default, free for all the AWS services. Um, so you don't pay anything additional for it. We just ensure that you're, you're, you are... Um, you're protected from the DDoS attacks either ways. But if you're looking at slightly more advanced protection, we offer you um, um, the Shield Advanced. Shield Standard takes care of three and four, layer three and four uh, protection for everyone. Um, Shield um, Standard is for layers, layer seven. It also includes the perimeter protection. Um, yeah, these are, you know, how our expertise would come into protection when uh, in, into, you know, service when you use our advanced services. I can send this across to you guys. I'm just trying to, you know, press, press through. Um, we have a DRT team that I said, right, who, who's going to watch your site, um, ensure that you're never getting, if you're getting attacked, we inform you, we take care of your threats. We see what kind of, um, you know, threats are going to come in the market. We mitigate it even before it hits you and so on. Um, so 24 bar 7. Cool. Last slide. Key takeaways. CDN is very critical for your business, for your business and for your end, end users' business. They build a very large site. If it's not, if you're not able to deliver that site to to, you, to their end users in an optimal manner, you're in trouble. Um, when you're using CDN, uh, you're 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 actually reducing the load on your origin, so your origin remains safeguarded. Um, we have options to reduce latencies using our uh, backbone. Um, and your entire uh, site application content is safeguarded using um, AWS's uh, security suite. Thank you, guys. Any questions? Thanks. Um, hi everyone. Um, thank you for the previous speakers to uh, you know give us an insight on AWS and on the other services. Um, like um, the slide says, it's edge services, right? So once you have um, hosted your content um, on storage or on our EC2 ELB um, and so on, how do you ensure that uh, that is available for your end users globally? So that's what Edge Services is all about. Um, there are five components um, in the Edge Services uh, product portfolio. 
the major one being CloudFront, which is a CDN. And uh, I'm sure most of you are using CDN uh, in your existing setup. Uh, we've got um, Route 53, which is our uh, uh, DNS, uh, WAF, anti-DDoS, which is part of our security services, and Lambda at the edge. Um, this is a quick graphical representation of how your data is going to travel to your end users. Um, for instance, that is where your content is hosted. It could be in your on-prem or at AWS. Um, when your end user is requesting for content, uh, the request all the way goes uh, to the origin, picks up the content, and comes back. It travels through multiple networks and ISPs. What we don't understand is that um, no one owns the internet, right? Um, and no one has got control how your data is passed between your origin and your end user. For instance, if your content is hosted in Delhi on-prem or you know at Mumbai AWS, and your end user is somewhere um, in Chennai, it is always not necessary that it takes the shortest route, right? Um, it there's all probability that the content travels probably from if your end user is in Chennai, it goes to Singapore, from Singapore to probably um, Japan, and Japan uh, to the US and comes back for the content. So it goes through multiple networks, um, ISPs, and so on. And what happens when when the data travels in such a manner? You've got a lot of delay, right? Um, your end users are very unhappy because your content uh, is not picked up in the fastest manner and it's not delivered in the fastest manner. And uh, apart from that, when it's traveling through the public internet, there's a lot of uh, chances that your data can be stolen, your site can be hacked, right? Um, and what that relates to is, you know, bad customer experience. So what happens when you have a CDN, uh, and especially if you have, you're hosted in uh, the AWS data center, and if you're using CloudFront as a CDN, it uses a it uses the uh, AWS's backbone. So we have a set uh, routes uh, to pick up and deliver content from your origin to your end user. So it, it uses a latency-based routing, right? So uh, content travels the fastest way possible, um, you know, using our AWS network and our Route 53. We've got the shield and uh, WAF, which protects your site and your, uh, you know, and your end, end user's personal information, um, and it's super fast. Um, it's not as simple as this is. There's a lot of technology that goes behind this in terms of routing and caching and so on. Um, to be, to put, put in a very simple word, right? What does a CDN do, right? Very simply, it reduces the load on the origin and it increases the end user satisfaction. So anything, if I could take an example of Facebook, right? Something that we all use. If you see most of Facebook's page is static the JS, CS, the body, except your image um, and something that is related to your personal information, just everything is static. So CDN would cache all that content as close as possible to the end user so that the request does not have to travel to the origin to pick up and deliver. So what happens? Your origin is safeguarded. You build a very small origin, as small as possible, to take care of minimal requests. The rest load is taken by the CDN servers, right? And when your content is picked up and delivered from a, from the from the closest uh, you know pop, your end users see a better satisfaction there. And this is a key benefit of a CDN. And who can use CDN? Any customer who has a website or an app, if that is revenue generating or if it's phase of the organization, it's very critical to have a CDN. I'm sure you work with a lot of SMBs and they want a beautiful site, right? If you look back, right about uh, 10 years back, we only had a very small site, a few hundred KBs in size. Now customers want a very interactive site. They want high quality images, very dynamic. Uh, now average site is about, what, two and a half to three MB in size. They spend so much, so much of money in building a site and a website. But what if it is not being able to tell, if you're not able to deliver that content in a fashionable manner? There's, there's no point, right, in you building a website. And this technology ensures that it takes care of that. Right? Whatever, you know, effort and money you're spending in building the content, it is taken care of by delivering it in an optimal manner. Um, yep. Yeah. I'm just running through really quick so that, you know, I'm not in between your Daru session. Um, 
So everyone have got a, you know, people think that hey, CDN can only be used for um, delivery of videos or large files and stuff. No, anything, anything that's delivered on HTTP, HTTPS, you, you could use CDN for a website delivery, for a API acceleration that is dynamic content, for um, anything that you have to do with content, uh, customized content uh, delivery with uh, Lambda at the edge, large file downloads like the large customers like Sony and um, Samsung, uh, then the video streaming like you can talk about Hotstar, um, Woot, uh, Sony and so on, um, and static object delivery which is the, the basic website, right? And how do we do it, right? Um, we do it by caching the content as close as possible to the end user and we, we've built POPs. POPs is nothing but points of presence where we cache content. So we've strategically placed 187 POPs globally and all these POPs are e, you know, interconnected using our own fiber or lease fiber. So we are forming a intranet over the internet, right? So the moment your content gets onto um, you know, the AWS backbone or, or CloudFront, it travels on our on our platform, on, you know, it, it travels on the private backbone. So delivery of content becomes very seamless. You see, these are, you know, basically uh, the, the, the cities. We've got 16 in India, um, and we're going to grow more. Um, there are 176 POPs and 11 RECs, right? Um, okay, this is information of how we deliver content, you know, basis. Uh, latency-based routing. Okay, this is very important. Um, RECs, you remember when I, when I, when I spoke about the, the importance of CDN, it reduces the load on the origin. So now we have got 187 POPs. Tomorrow or probably in a year, we might have a have a thousand POPs. So your origin would get requests from all those thousand POPs if the content is requested by the end user. So we are we are actually defying our the basic of CDN, right? So your origin is going to be loaded again. So to ensure that your origin is not loaded and to ensure that the caching is done for a longer duration, we built the regional edge cache. Regional edge cache is 10x the size minimum of a normal uh, pop, so it can cache content for the longer duration. And the regional edge cache is the only uh, pop that is designated to talk to your origin infrastructure. So when you have a billion requests coming from multiple pops, it hits the regional edge cache and one request goes to your origin and that's it. Your origin has to only provide information to that one request and rest is replicated. Until unless your content is highly dynamic, um, probably like a stock ticker or a, a quick buzz, right, where the scores are changing every second. Otherwise, you can use the origin, the regional edge cache to deliver your content. Um, these are a few examples, right? So we've got Airtel, one of our largest customers in India. Um, so the reason I brought up Airtel, even though we've got larger customers, similar larger customers is because Airtel already has their own network in India, right? Um, it is very probably easy for them to, you know, build a Syrian and deliver content, but it is not possible. And that's the only reason they, they rely on us uh, because we've got the expertise. So they deliver 50 million, uh, you know, videos and they've got 50 million users. They, they've delivered a 1.2 million peak during the India, South Africa series. Um, Vink is on us, part of Airtel again, where we deliver uh, you know, close to 2 billion songs in a month. Uh, other customers are ShareChat. I don't know if you've heard of ShareChat. It's similar to TikTok. It's a vernacular um, based um, uh, social media organization. Um, we had a challenge there to deliver content to tier 3 and tier 4 cities um, on 2G and 3G mobile. So we optimized the network to do that. Um, Geo Savan delivers a lot of content for us. Uh, all Balaji is all in on us. They um, deliver all kind of OTT content. Um, LRN is an enterprise customer. They, are a, um, they do training on ethics, right, and compliances. They, they, uh, they migrated from one of our largest competitors onto us. Um, so this, this is to just let you guys know that, hey, for CloudFront, CloudFront is an independent service of AWS, right? We don't care what your origin is. It could be your, you know, on-prem, it could be a third party. We will perform the way it is optimal. It becomes a little more easier if it is AWS because there is a, a backbone connectivity between CloudFront and the AWS uh, services, but otherwise you could use any origin for that matter to deliver content. Um, a quick representation of you know um, what is dynamic, right? This is dynamic content. 
uh, rest everything is static. Your cart is static. Um, these are dynamic content. Otherwise, everything is static on this. So, uh, on a website, typically 80% of the content is static. The rest is dynamic. So, you, you can make out, right? Um, pricing. CloudFront has got a very straightforward pricing. It's got a private pricing where we only charge you for what has been consumed by your end user. Period. There is no, we, we take care of the request component, HTTPS delivery is taken care of, we don't charge for midgress, we don't charge any platform fees, and so on. So it's a pretty straightforward pricing. Um, Lambda at the edge, it is sim something similar to LightSail, um, where you move all your, you know, smaller components, um, what, you, what you actually do on your Lambda to the edge. For instance, image re resizing or redirection. So it does not need you to, where you don't need to have an application to be hosted, you can all push that to the edge. So that's that's a service that we offer on CloudFront. Um, WAF and Shield security is prime for you know Amazon and AWS. Am I running out of time? So um, we've got okay. This is quickly the kind of threats that you see um, with AWS uh, WAF and Shield. We are able to take care of. Um, all the security threats to layer, layer 7 protection. These are a few of the, um, you know, the threats that you usually see in the market. Um, bad bots, um, SQL injection. So we take care of the transport, um, application network layer all put together. Um, in DDoS, we have an option to, there's a team that um, ensures that your content, your site, your application is monitored day in and day out. Um, we work as your extended team. Um, to prepare, monitor, and respond to, you know, if there's an attack that happens. Um, so we've got built-in protection and protection tools. We work with a lot, lot of uh, partners with this. It's very easy to use. Like any of the other AWS services, you just, you know, pay for as, as much as you use. As simple as that. Um, sorry. These are fewer of of our partners. Um, who help us manage um, the, the security services for us. Um, in, in the, okay, WAF benefits, as I said, it's affordable, easy to deploy, and you just pay for what you use. Um, we've got two services under, uh, uh, under a WAF, under a security services. One is the Shield, and the Shield Standard, and the Shield Advanced. Shield Standard is, by default, free for all the AWS services. Um, so you don't pay anything additional for it. We just ensure that you're, you're, you are... Um, you are protected from the DDoS attacks either ways. But if you're looking at slightly more advanced protection, we offer you um, um, the Shield Advanced. Shield Standard takes care of three and four, layer three and four um, protection for everyone. Um, Shield um, Standard is for layers, layer seven. It also includes a perimeter protection. Um, yeah, these are, you know, how our expertise would come into protection when uh, in, into, you know, service when you use our advanced services. I can send this across to you guys. I'm just trying to, you know, press, press through. Um, we have a DRT team that I said, right, who, who's going to watch your site, uh, ensure that you're never getting, if you're getting attacked, we inform you, we take care of your threats. We see what kind of, um, you know, threats are going to come in the market. We mitigate it even before it hits you and so on. Um, so 24 bar 7. Cool. Last slide. Key takeaways. CDN is very critical for your business, for your business and for your end, end users' business. They build a very large site. If it's not, if you're not able to deliver that site to to, you, to their end users in an optimal manner, you're in trouble. Um, when you're using CDN, uh, you're 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 actually reducing the load on your origin, so your origin remains safeguarded. Um, we have options to reduce latencies with using our uh, backbone. Um, and your entire uh, site application content is safeguarded using um, AWS's uh, security suite. Thank you, guys. Any questions? <laughs>